Hi, good afternoon, Volta Latino community. I'm here today at the Health and Human Services Department with Secretary Kathleen Sebelius to answer your questions on the Affordable Care Act. There's been a lot of myths out there, and what we want to do today is debunk those myths and learn a little bit more about how the Affordable Care Act impacts you, impacts your family, and impacts your pocketbook. So stay tuned, and we have Kathleen Sebelius here to talk about all of that, but more importantly, we will be fielding some of your questions that you provided us earlier this week and also get more into the meat and potatoes of how we can make sure that you're signing up for coverage. Thank you so much, Secretary. Great to be with you, Maria Teresa. Thank you so much for joining us here at HHS today. I'm, I'm really excited to be here and I'm excited to host you here. I know that at Voto Latino, the idea that Latino issues are American issues and American issues are Latino issues has been always at the heart of everything you do. Uh, you were ahead of the curve in highlighting the importance of young Latinos across the country and the impact they have on everything from our economy to voting. And I think this especially resonates when it comes to health care. In the clip we're about to see, I want to introduce you to Myrna. Now, Myrna is a breast cancer survivor from Cleveland. She shares her story about her struggle to obtain health insurance. Thank you. My name is Myrna. I am a commercial real estate broker. I've been doing it for about 16, 17 years. I was diagnosed with breast cancer in 2003. Conference room that seats 20. At the time, I was not married. Most real estate agents are independent contractors, self-employed. I interviewed seven different insurance agents. None of them would sell me insurance. Insurance companies turned me down, rejected me because I had a pre-existing condition. Thank God I was actually on the, in the process of getting married because my choices at that point in time because of the bills I was facing over a half a million dollars worth of treatment within a few months of us getting married the health insurance I was automatically added it's been nine years and I am cancer free at this point in time life is good things are changing with health care which is positive for me don't lose hope don't lose hope and don't give up the fight So the clip that we just saw with Myrna, Myrna represents 15 million uninsured Latinos. Secretary, how does the ACA now prevent folks with, actually allow folks such as Myrna who had a pre-existing condition, how does it address that and what other health care benefits can people now expect because of ACA? Well, this is a really a brand new day for health insurance. Um, for the first time ever in the history of this country, a health insurance company cannot deny someone coverage because of a pre-existing health condition. Now in Myrna's case it was breast cancer, but it could be a diagnosis of diabetes, it could be a child with asthma, it could be a cancer survivor. In the past an insurance company could say to that person if they didn't have a big group policy and protected, we just don't want to sell you insurance at all and they were really out of luck. So that can never happen again. Uh, the other very exciting thing, and I think particularly for the Vota Latina uh, audience, the young and healthy, is the focus on preventive care in health insurance policies. Not only do you have full benefits, so if you need to go to the hospital, that's covered, or prescription drugs, that's covered, but preventive care we know keeps people healthy in the first place, and that's part of the goal. So flu shots and cancer screenings, mammograms for women, um, a whole series of uh, contraceptive coverage, uh, issues that people had to pay out of pocket for in advance are part of your health insurance plan with no encourage people to really stay healthy and keep healthy. And you talk a little, can you talk a little bit more about that with women's health? I think a lot of women don't realize all of this and all the tools and availability of exams they can have now because of the ACA. Well, you bet. Uh, again, in the past, uh, there were health plans that pretty much were designed around men in the workplace, uh, often left out coverage for women. So part of what Congress did was say, we need to take a look at where the gaps are for women's health and uh, have a package of services 
added to all insurance plans specifically designed for women. So it's everything from, um, again, cancer screenings to uh, for new moms. There is lactation support and help. There's prenatal care, contraceptive coverage, uh, knowing that that's a frequently taken drug by women 14 to 40, uh, domestic violence screening, mental health services, all of those services that are used by women, needed by women, and often were missing. So if women got them at all, even if they had insurance coverage, they were paying out of their own pocket to try and get those services. And I guess I just want to emphasize, because the majority of the Latino population on average is 27 years old, these issues that you're talking about, these exams that they can have now and the contraception that's available to them is really hitting the core of who the Latino audience is and who the healthcare provider really needs to address their issues of healthcare. Too. That's absolutely correct. It's it's that young, healthy woman that we uh, know are the majority of the population, and and often, you know, they're taking care of parents, they're taking care of their children, they're often pushing their spouse or boyfriend to get coverage. They their coverage comes last. This is a real, and what we know is women often work in jobs where they don't have employer-sponsored healthcare. So they were often the ones shopping in the marketplace. The other thing, Maria Teresa, that I should have mentioned from the start, an insurance company can never charge a woman more than a man again. Can you say that again? <laughs> no. An insurance company can never charge a woman more than a man again. Right now, young women who are buying insurance coverage on their own can be charged 50, 75 percent more than a man just because of the services they need and want. Those days are over. And also, I mean, I'm, I'm very much expecting right now, <laughs> also pre-existing conditions. Congratulations. <laughs> Thank you. But, but as a pregnant woman before ACA, I would have actually had, if I had gone into the marketplace, I would have actually been denied possibly because of a pre-existing condition of pregnancy. That's not possible anymore, correct? Well, that's not possible to be denied, but also many of the policies for sale in the so-called individual market when you're out shopping on your own didn't even have pregnancy coverage. So you might have had a health plan only to learn happily that you're expecting a baby and then find out that you don't have coverage at all and you can't buy coverage at all once you're pregnant. So again, women were often in this terrible situation where the services they needed were not in the policy. They couldn't buy the policy that they needed and the services often then were hugely costly so they often went without care. I, I think that's a very valuable piece to underline because oftentimes women didn't even realize, as you said, that yeah. once they were pregnant, that they couldn't even get the the care that they needed. That's right. Now, a lot of the now, I think one of the things that came from our audience, uh, the questions that we fielded, was that there were a lo number of complications with the rollout of the ACA. How do you respond to the folks that have tried to enroll and got a little frustrated because they they weren't able to? What what fixes have been put in place? And I use California as an example, where close to 30% of Latinos who have tried to enroll have basically stopped through mid-application because of so, some of that frustration. Can you just address that? Well, I don't think there's any question that in October, November, the federal website was really challenged. And unfortunately, our challenges then um, kind of cascaded around the country. So Californians may have had some difficulties. It's been a whole new experience since the end of November. We were committed to making the technical fixes. So a customer experience was very smooth and easy. That's been done. Cuidado de Salud, which was missing at the beginning, is now up and running and loaded. So if somebody is more comfortable looking at the entire website in Spanish and working their way through in Spanish, that's very much available to customers. And our call center, mm -hmm. which is 1-800-318-2596, open 24 hours a day, seven days a week. And callers are available in English and Spanish to actually walk someone through the website or enroll them in coverage without ever going to the website. That's wonderful. And then how does the Affordable Care Act affect those in states where they're not accepting Medicaid expansion? We know that there's states such as Florida and Texas who have large Latino populations that could actually, under the federal mandate, actually be able to receive a lot of these extended benefits but cannot. What, what's your advice to them? What can they do? Well, I think, first of all, it's really important for um, the young Latinos who live in that state to uh, literally find out it, who they are and talk to their state legislators because there's no deadline for states to accept Medicaid expansion. In fact, can, they... Can you talk a little bit to our audience and explain what Medicaid expansion sure. is? Medicaid is really the insurance coverage that's a state and federal partnership for um, people 
uh, who are working, uh, working adults, but who earn less than, in this case, 133% of poverty. That's about $19,000 a year or less mm -hmm. if you're an individual. You would be eligible for what is very low cost but comprehensive insurance coverage. So what the federal government said to states across the country is if you expand Medicaid to make sure that everybody up to uh, $19,000 a year if you're a single person and up to about $36,000 a year if you're a family, if you extend benefits to them, we will pay 100% of the costs of those newly insured. The federal government will. The federal government will for three years. Mm -hmm. And then gradually a state has to kick in some money, but never more than 10%. Mm -hmm. So for an individual living in Texas or Florida, they would have very comprehensive insurance coverage for very low cost. We want to continue this conversation with governors and state legislators. They're the ones who have to pass the bill. They just have to say, we accept the offer from the federal government. So we continue that conversation. But for the la young Latinos in a state where expansion has not yet been decided, mm -hmm. talking to their legislators, writing a letter to their governor saying, I'm here, I vote, I'm watching, I want my insurance benefits, and please take a new look at this would be very helpful. And remind them that they pay taxes. You bet. That's right. You bet. So another question that we received, actually, and this is from Diana in Florida as well, is that if she makes $85,000 for a five, family of five, can she receive any financial subsidies for her health care? And if so, how, when would those kick in, basically? Well, the, the way that the marketplace, so there's Medicaid expansion, the way the law was written, Medicaid expansion would be for the lowest income working families, uh, and that would go up to, as they say, about 133% of poverty. Above that, individuals can qualify for what's called an accelerated tax credit. Now, most people are used to filing their taxes in April, and then if there's money owed back, it comes back you know, at the end of the year. This is a different kind of tax credit. Uh, when you go on the website, healthcare.gov or cuidadodesalud.gov, you put in information about the income you earn, and you find out at $85,000 with a family of five that indeed you are entitled to some financial help to buy your health insurance. And actually, that financial help comes from day one. So you can actually use it all throughout the year to help pay for your premiums. So it calculates what you are, Maria Teresa, what you and your family would be entitled to. And it will apply that as you look at insurance policies and their charges, what you would actually pay at the end of the day. And that money is automatically, your policy is adjusted so that your tax credit is added in. So for instance, if you lived in, in Miami and earned about $27,000 a year, you could find a policy for under $75 a month. Mm -hmm. And that is with your tax credit. If you're a family of four living in Dallas and earn about $50,000 a year, you could find a, an insurance policy for under $50 a month. Uh, so those are available, and they would start day one. And so what I'm hearing from you, Secretary Sebelius, is, is that this this Affordable Care Act doesn't only impact individuals that are basically oftentimes facing poverty or in the poverty line, That's right. but it impacts the middle class. It's absolutely about the middle class. It's really about people who, because of where they work, don't have an employer paying a share of their coverage. So if you work for a big company, mm -hmm. often you're in a situation where the employer kicks in some money for your health insurance, you kick in some money, and makes it affordable for you and your family. Lots of people, entrepreneurs, small business owners, uh, musicians, artists, people who are working on their own, graduate students, young moms, don't have employer-based coverage, and they really need to shop on their own. Those and it moves with them, correct? It does. It okay. does indeed. So now you have actually the federal government mm -hmm. paying for a share of your insurance, the same way an employer would in a workplace. Excellent. And then another question that we received was basically that someone has enrolled in the, their health plan in San Jose, California, but they haven't gotten a letter yet from their health insurance company for their first fee. What should they do next? Well, the first thing that's really important is call that insurance company. You are their new customer. Mm -hmm. And if there's a problem, um, the insurance company would be the first to identify it. Uh, they can make sure that 
the person really is enrolled in their plan. They want their new customers and they may have dropped the ball along the way and not sent the right card or not sent the right application, but just pick up the phone and call your new company. Okay. And then there's other folks on the other side of the spectrum who are yet to apply for insurance. How do they go about it? Well, the best and easiest way, if you have access to a computer and have some uh, technology savvy, is go to healthcare.gov or cuidadodesalud.gov and look at what's available. Uh, there's a shopping side to see what plans are in the marketplace and often there are 30, 40, 50 plans to choose from depending on where you live. You can enter some information about your income and find out what kind of financial help there will be and most of the people who don't have insurance coverage right now are going to be entitled to some financial help. Uh, a lot of people don't know that and we want to make sure they know that it's it's really affordable for the first time. And then you can work your way through the website. Now what we're hearing from people is it takes no more than 30 minutes. Mm -hmm. uh, you need some information in advance uh, about you know your family size, if you're applying for just yourself or your entire family, where you live, income status, and you can make it from start to finish, choose a plan, and then enroll. And what are those? What about those unique cases? We had someone basically from from New York share with us that she's young, she's healthy, and she went. Her premiums actually increased. And what do you? What would you share with her? Because what we're also hearing is a lot of folks saying, you know, I'd rather I'd rather get the fine, pay the fine as a young person. What What can we share with her? Well, I think again, for the vast majority of young people, they're going to find a very affordable plan, cheaper than the cost of their cell phone bill. Mm -hmm. uh, and I would say it's really about making a grown-up financial decision. You can't afford not to have health insurance because no matter how healthy we all think we are, we're one diagnosis, one accident, one motorcycle ride away from having a serious health issue. And if you have no insurance and you get yourself into a situation where somebody hits your car or you fall on the basketball court or you have a diagnosis of breast cancer, that bill, that treatment, those issues could bankrupt you and your family for the rest of your life. So having the peace of mind, having the security, not only for yourself but for your family, uh, is really an important step to take. And for someone that, that if they saw that their insurance did go up, would you encourage them to, that perhaps they did something wrong to, to contact their state? There's I, state exchange. I, mean, what, what I, think it's, I think it's certainly worthwhile either mm -hmm. calling the toll-free call-in number or going back to the front end of the uh, on healthcare.gov. Mm -hmm. There's a learn side with all the plans. It's it's possible that their old company, if they had insurance, mm -hmm. uh, has only plans on the market that are more expensive. The great news is for most people is they have choices they've never had before. So I wouldn't just assume that the one policy mm -hmm. that they had in the past and went up is their only choice. Go back and see what the other choices are. And open enrollment mm -hmm. for the new health plans lasts until the 31st of March. So there's still 10 weeks left. And what happens if they don't enroll by March 31st? Well, they really have missed a uh, great opportunity uh, and have to wait until open enrollment comes around next year, uh, which will be in the fall, um, unless they have what's called a change of circumstance. So if you have a baby, right. Um, and need to change your policy based on your baby or if you had coverage because your spouse was in a workplace and your spouse dies or you get a divorce, you then have an opportunity to enroll uh, in a special period. But other than that, you've really missed the opportunity and when you pay your taxes the following year, there will be a fine for not having taken advantage of affordable health care. But they could rectify it the following year. You bet. Okay, so you it's bet. not the, their only opportunity. Every year there will be an open enrollment period. Excellent. And then, you know, the federal agency, ICE, basically came out with a memo saying that mixed status families and the Affordable Care Act are not competing for each other. Can you talk a little bit about that? What what was, what was were they referring to specifically? Well, I think that um, they are. there are certain rules that were written into the Affordable Care Act about who is eligible, in particular who is eligible for a tax credit. And you have to be you know, a legal resident in order to be entitled to a tax credit and purchase health insurance in the marketplace. But I think people were worried, would any kind of information be used potentially to turn over to the Homeland Security folks? Would it result in some kind of difficulty for their family or having their names on a list? And what I think people will find is that there's a very clear memo out by uh, the, the immigration agency that says nothing 
collected in the Affordable Care Act information will be shared with anybody, will be used for anything other than health insurance. And I think that's a very important myth to, to debunk right now because a lot of what we're hearing a lot from our members and the folks in the community is that they are afraid to share their information because they're afraid of where it's going to land. But what I'm hearing from you, Secretary, is that ICE has issued a memo saying that they will not pursue individuals and with mixed status families so they can sh freely share their information with healthcare.gov and insurance companies. Is that That's correct? correct. That is correct. And at the front of the website, uh, mm -hmm. people will be asked about their legal status. And that's primarily because you will not be entitled to a tax credit if you are not a legal resident. But that information is not taken and shared with anyone. It is totally secure. It's totally private. And um, again, we have verification from the ICE folks that they intend very much to keep it that way. Excellent. And then another thing right along there is that we we're hearing that depending on your sta status, if you're a DACA student, basically a deferred action student, right, right. It really depends on what state they're in, whether or not they're allowed to have insurance. Is that correct? Can you? Well, I think that there are. I'm. I'm basically telling you the rules, mm -hmm. Maria Theresa, that yeah. apply to mm -hmm. the federal marketplace. That, and that's what clarification. And mm -hmm. um, there are some states that are using state funding mm -hmm. to extend those benefits beyond what the federal rules are. But so they would really need to check. I think the District of Columbia is doing some things that Arizona may not be doing. So it's important to also check at the state level and see if there are additional benefits available um, to particular residency statuses. But at least as far as the federal marketplace is concerned, uh, no one who is not a legal resident will qualify. Excellent. And I want to thank you for this time. I, I'm getting the signal that we're wrapped, but I want to thank you so much for this time oh, and for the work that you've done. And more importantly, the Affordable Care Act is, is going to prevent many of our families not to have to file insurance uh, bankruptcy, That's but right. instead to stay healthy and to stay working and to make sure that we're providing appropriately for our families. So thank you so much for your time. It's great and to we look be forward with you to talking. Good luck with your <laughs> extended family. That's very exciting. No, we're super excited. Yeah. And for folks, I, the secretary shared many many websites and resources with us today. You can go ahead and visit votolatino.org to find links to those resources and also healthcare.gov. Thanks again for tuning in. Ron Wise Show.